صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب من تمسك بكم وأمن من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا صدق الله العلي العظيم In the name of Allah, the gracious, the most merciful, may the peace and the blessings of the Almighty Allah be with and amongst all the prophets and messengers, including the last and the beloved Muhammad and his honorable and dignified progeny. Respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Since the beginning of creation, once we analyze history and the history of mankind on the face of this earth, we find that human beings have been suffering from the problem of discrimination from the very beginning and the very early years of life on the face of this earth. For it has been said that's the reason why Habil killed Qabil was due to some sort of discrimination that Qabil had against Habil. And as time has developed, and as centuries have came and left, discrimination still and until today exists amongst human beings. There are many different types of discrimination that the world suffers from today. Many individuals on economical, social, political and religious grounds have came forward to lead the way of humanity to put away this disgusting habit of discriminating against one another. There are many types of discrimination that exist amongst human beings. However, the most important types of discrimination as they have been hunting down individuals around the globe are number one, discrimination in an economical way. The economical discrimination. What is economical discrimination? The scholars of human behavior have said that economical discrimination is when I receive a service as an employer from an individual and I pay him less than he deserves just because he is less likely to find a job and make a living, I come and I exploit that individual's abilities and services 
and pay him less than what he deserves. Or for example, on a larger scale, economical discrimination means that this country, this specific country, for example, is the maker of such and such product. Or this specific country is the number one seller of oil. Or this specific country has the ability to, for example, export such and such types of fruits to the world. Now, just because this country is suffering politically or socially from different ways, I come and economically discriminate against them and pay them less for what they have from services just because they don't have the ability to sell it elsewhere. Economical discrimination could take place in many different ways, but we have to move forward. The second type of discrimination is racial and, and um, ethnic discrimination. Racial and ethnic discrimination is when I come and pay someone less, or respect someone less, or employ someone less than others just because this person has this specific ethnic or racial background. This person is for example African American, or this person is Indian, or this person is, is not from my nationality, or this person is not from my um, ancestors. Racial and ethnic profiling here comes and discriminates against individuals. And today, we find this everywhere. If you're a Muslim, or you're an Arab, or you're a Middle Eastern, at the majority of the airports of the Western world, you'll be stopped, you'll be questioned, you'll be questioned, you'll be humiliated. Why? Because there is racial and ethnic profiling against you and discrimination. And for the most part, the world has also suffered from discriminating against the female gender, against women. See, for the most part, women ag around the world have been discriminated against, have been belittled, have been put down, have not been respected. Even today in the Western world that speaks of the highest levels of freedom and equality, cannot give equal importance to female to the to the male and female gender thus on social political religious grounds many leaders have came forward to lead individuals to leave discrimination and to come forward and treat e each other with brotherhood and equality the Holy Qur'an, the last and the purest and the most complete of scriptures sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes forward in Surah Al-Hujurat to treat the problem of discrimination and to bring about justice and equality amongst human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَىٰ وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ Let us come to understand this verse. This verse could not be dissected and analyzed and examined in one day. You're going to need so many days and so many lectures and so many presentations to truly understand the essence of this verse. But we shall peruse through this verse quickly and cover as many aspects as time will permit us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuhan nas. Why does Allah start the verse with Ya ayyuhan nas? Why doesn't He, for example, say Ya ayyuhan ladhina amanu? Or Ya Ayyuhal Muslimun, or Ya Ayyuhal Mu'minun. Why does he say Ya Ayyuhal Nas? The Mufassirin have said the verses that begin with Ya Ayyuhal Nas 
or Ya Bani Adam are the verses that are sent down in Mecca. Why? Because Muslims were less and they were outnumbered by individuals at that time. Thus, Allah comes and says, Ya Ayyuhan Nas, speaks to all of people because they have not yet converted to Islam. And at other times he says, Ya Bani Adam, the children of Adam. And the verses that are sent down in Medina are the verses that speak to the Muslimin. So the verses say, for example, Ya Ayyuhan Ladina Amanu. And speaks to the believers. But this specific verse is an exception. It is sent down in Medina, but it still says, Ya Ayyuhan Nas. Why? For it comes to cure the problem of discrimination and to bring about equality in society. And in the Muslim society in Medina, there were Muslims and non-Muslims. There were Muslims and non-Muslims. Thus this verse, even though it was sent down in Medina, and the majority of the readers of the Qur'an are Muslimin, it wants them to know that this specific verse is for all of humanity. That is why if you go to the United Nations today, you will read this verse, Ya Ayyuhan Nas. It speaks to all of humanity. We have created you from male and female. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلٍ And we have made you in tribes and different nationalities. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا So that you shall know each other, meet each other, learn from each other. إِنْ أَكْرَمَكُمْ The most honorable one of you. And Allah أَتْقَاكُمْ Amongst Allah is the one with more piety. Let us come and dissect this verse Step by step, number one, why was this verse sent down? The Mufassireen have said that this verse sent, was sent down to honor the Mu'addin of Rasulullah, the spokesman of Rasulullah, Bilal al-Habashi. Bilal from Habasha. Bilal the African. Bilal the slave. Bilal, that man that was nothing compared to the Arabs according to their own Level of discrimination. You know, Arabs at that time were the most discriminative people. So what happened was, Bilal, the slave, was freed. Uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, a, a long story short, he, he became a free man. And he, became, and he came to Medina. And in Medina, Rasulullah built a masjid. And when he built the masjid, Allah says, Ya Rasulullah, you have to lead the prayers now. The congregational prayer, Salatul Jama'ah, in your masjid. And you have to call people to come forward and to, to, to pray behind you. And you have to do that by using the adhan. So Rasulullah sat with the people, and people began to give him different perspectives on how he should do the adhan. Some people said, let us be like the Christians and ring the bell. Some of them said, no, let us turn on a fire, and when people see the fire, they'll come. Some of them said, we'll have a person go knock at the doors of individuals. Some of them said, we'll have someone shout in the streets. Until Jibra'il came down to Rasulullah, and he taught him the adhan. Ya Rasulullah, this is how you perform the adhan. Rasulullah at that time called upon Bilal. Bilal. He told him, Ya Bilal. This is the adhan, and this is how you will call people to come to the masjid. He went, and he stood on top of the masjid of Rasulullah, and he began to shout, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And he continued with the adhan. People came, and they said, some of them came forward and said, Ya Rasulullah. This man, he's the worst one of us. He's a slave. How do you have him become your spokesman? Number one. Number two, he cannot even say ashhadu. He says ashhadu. He cannot even speak Arabic properly. How can you come and make him a spokesman on top of all those Arabs that know how to say ashhadu an la ilaha illallah are more honorable 
Rasulullah said to them, Seenu Bilalin, Sheenun and Allah. When Bilal says Seen, Allah hears it Sheen. Allah takes it as a Sheen. For Bilal cannot say Seen. It cannot say Sheen. He says Seen. But Allah accepts his adhan in that specific matter. Someone else, salam Allah, someone else came to Rasulullah and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I'm glad that my father died. He said, why? He says, so that he would not see the slave go on top of the masjid and say the adhan. Did you not have anyone else to perform the adhan, Ya Rasulullah? Rasulullah was very saddened. And as soon as Rasulullah became sad that his ummah has such a high level of discrimination, the verse came down, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuha nas anna khalaqnakum min dhakaran wa untha. What is the verse here? What is the verse saying here? Dhakaran wa untha. We have created you from male and female. And why is it that Allah says we have created you from male and female? The scholars of tafsir and the ulama of the Quran have said, number one reason why Allah says dhakaran wa untha is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me and you to know the things that we have in common with the rest of humanity. That both of us only belong to one biological father and one biological mother. No one can have two biological mothers or two biological fathers. We have to have one biological father and one biological mother. We are all born in this specific way. All of human beings have to go through this step to come about to this life. Other Mufassirin have said, no, Allah wants us to know that our father and mother are the same. Hawa and Adam. Adam and Eve are our parents. They are our forefathers. So we are all brothers and sisters in humanity. And that is what Amir al Mu'mineen or Mawla al Muhaddin, Ali ibn Abi Talib, says to Malik al Ashtar, his ambassador, he writes to him, Ya Malik. O Malik, وَلَا تَكُنْ عَلَيْهِمْ سَبْعًا ضَارِيًا Don't be like a lion on top of them, frighten them. عَلَى رَعِيَّتِكْ فَأَنَّهُمْ صُنْفَانِ For those people that you are ruling, and those people that are under you, فَأَنَّهُمْ صُنْفَانِ They're in two categories. إِمَّا أَخٌ لَكَ فِي الدِّينِ Either a brother in faith or a brother in humanity. أَوْ نَظِيرٌ لَكَ فِي الْخَلْقِ and this is what you will also find in the United Nations today to teach the world the divine messages of Allah. And this by itself is a proof that Ali was the Khalifa of Muhammad. For when Ali speaks, you know that this is Muhammad speaking. And when Muhammad speaks, you know that this is what Allah wants us to hear. And that is how even non-Muslims come forward to recognize that this, those words are full of lights and glory. But it's unfortunate that Ali amongst the Muslims is not recognized. You are less likely to hear Ali has said. You are less likely to hear that the son of Abu Talib said such and such. This, this great man that is Muslim that has seen injustice in history. Anyways, we come back to the, to the verse. Inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'il. And we have put you in different tribes and ethnicities. We have put you in different nationalities. Why? لِتَعَارَفُوا And the Mufassireen here say specifically, تَعَارَفُوا means that you have interracial marriages. The black marries the white, and the white marries the black. And the African marries the German, and the German marries the Japanese, and the Japanese marries the Indian. This is the message of Islam. So that you come together to understand the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to recite this verse. This verse came specifically, some of us say this part of the verse came specifically when Rasulullah told them to marry their mawali. What is a mawla? A mawla is when I have a slave and I free the slave. He becomes known in the Arabic language as mawla. And the plural form of those individuals is mawali. Rasulullah says, marry your daughters to your mawali. He was your slave back then, but now he's a free man. 
marry your daughter to him. They said, Ya Rasulullah, he was our slave, how can we marry? He said, no, you have to. And he brought his relative, Zainab, and he told her that you have to marry one of those mawali, and she did. And the Mufassireen have mentioned many individuals that have married ex-slaves in Arabia. لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ The most honorable one of you. Where? See, honor through the perspective of people is fame, glory, money, wealth, popularity. This is karam and glory amongst people. If you want to be glamorous, and if you want to be popular, and if you want to be loved, you have to have money, you have to have fame, you have to have beauty. But the verse here doesn't say about, doesn't speak of people. It says, إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Do you know what it means to be honorable through the perspective of Allah rather than the perspective of human beings? Do you know what it means to be honorable when Allah looks at you and He says, this is an honorable servant of mine? Go think about it. Go think about what it means to be honorable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's perspective. The ones that have more taqwa, the ones that implement those verses. And it is unfortunate that we don't implement, implement this verse. Today if, an, if a non-Arab goes to marry an Arab, they say, you're not an Arab, how can we give you? If this nationality wants to marry outside, it, outside the nationality, they'll tell him, no, we can't give you. A Persian outside, a Pakistani outside, an Indian outside. They don't intergrade and they don't mix because they find themselves superior to others. This is not the message of Islam. This is one meaning to taqwa. Another meaning of taqwa is when we never take our sins lightly. And I want the youth to really take those words seriously and go think about them. If you want to become great individuals in society, if you want to be people that will be remembered for millions of years and eternity un until the day of judgment, don't take your sins lightly. It's a small lie. It's a small backbite. It's a small ghiba. It's a small namima. It's a small look and a glance at something haram. نعوذ بالله نعوذ بالله it's a small sip of wine and intoxicants it's a small puff of, of drugs and intoxic نعوذ بالله you take your sins lightly you lose your taqwa and when you lose your taqwa you lose your honor you may have honor with people but you will never have honor with Allah then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إن الله خبير عليم in this verse Khabirun Alim is an individual that is wise and knowledgeable and has the ability to create individuals that will execute his orders and demonstrate Islam in the best of ways. You see brothers, Islam is a religion that needs to be illustrated and demonstrated. Today, if I come and say equality, if I come and say freedom, if I come and say justice, if I come and say liberty, if I come and say fidelity and honor, bravery, those are just words. When I put them into action, when I demonstrate the bravery, when I demonstrate the honesty, when I demonstrate mercy, when I demonstrate equality, is when those words have a life and a meaning in them. Allah says, Alimun Khabir, in the end, that He will have servants on the face of this earth that will show and execute those beautiful meanings of this, of, uh, that are confined in this verse. And tonight I just want to shed some light, some light on a life of a man that the world has not yet known. You see Allah says that He has created the jinn and the ins, He has created human beings and jinns, why? لِيَعْبُدُونَ so that they would worship Him. And He wants worship from us and nothing else. Now, when we come to worship Allah, is it that we have to stay in the masjid all day and night and pray and, and supplicate? Or no, we can 
bring about worship in our daily lives. Islam says, worship Allah and do your ibadah in your daily life. When you deal with people, when you speak to people, when you treat people, when at home, at business, in school, you're always in the state of ibadah. Now imagine an individual that is the beautifier and the decorator and the most honorable and the most beautiful of worshippers. Zaynul Abideen. Zaynul Abideen. Al-Imam Al-Sajjad Salamullahi Alayhi. This man is a man that used to perform 1,000 rak'ah of prayers every day. There is so much to say about Imam Sajjad, Imam Zain al Abidin, but in connection to this verse, let us shed some light on the life of Zain al Abidin. First of all, as the, the, the birth of Imam Zain al Abidin is very important. He was born from Imam Hussein and the daughter of Yazid Jird, the king of Persia, Shah Banu. Shah Banu was the daughter of Yazid Jird. Imam Hussein married her and she gave birth to Imam Zain al Abidin. And the second one of Yazjird's daughter, Imam Hassan, married, and the third one, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. When she gave birth to Imam Zain al Abidin, many areas and many files and many doors opened. One of them was that if an Arab marries a non Arab, it would be a disaster in that time. Imam Hussein came and broke that notion that an Arab can only marry an Arab. Second, in the time when she was taken, she was taken as a, a prisoner of war. A prisoner of war becomes a slave in Arabia back then. Now imagine marrying a slave. No one would respect a person that is born out of a slave, but when Imam Zain al Abidin was born out of a slave mother or a mother that was taken as a political prisoner that brought people's minds and uplifted their minds to a level for them to understand that when you take individuals out of your own culture or out of your own system or individuals are less than you they may come about to show that they are more superior and better than you in many ways and in thousand folds. And another chapter that it opened was that in that time from the time of the first Khalifa, specifically the time of second Khalifa until Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's Khilafa, there were invasions. I cannot call them liberations. They were invasions of and, 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 and individuals conquering land. They were conquering land and, and people would, uh, would feel hatred towards Islam. You see, when Persia was conquered, people would hate those individuals that conquered them. When Imam Hussein came and married their daughter, he showed them that now we are family and now we have came into one circle of trust and thus he took the hatred out of their hearts. This is the first area. Second area is Imam Zain al Abidin and his intellectual revival of the Ummah. Imam Zain al Abidin came forward and he did not discriminate against every single individual in his time and he created a sense of equality by enriching the intellectual approach of individuals. Their intellect and their emotions were being killed. They were being driven away. Imam Zain al-Abidin came and brought intellect back into the lives of the Muslim Ummah. He would sit in the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and people would ask him questions and he would answer them. And one of the elements that he spoke always spoke about was the element of equality and he always spoke against discrimination and one time he walked into the presence of a man he told him you think you're an imam and you are uh, born out of a, a mother that was a slave what do you think you are imam zain al-abidin says if you think that is a a problem 
a prophet of Allah was born out of a slave mother. He said, who? He said, Ismail, go read the Quran. Ismail, the son of Ibrahim, was born out of a, a, a slave mother and he became a prophet of Allah. Thus, honor is not in what is the status of your parents. And third is that Imam Zainul Abideen, Salamullahi Alayh, had the best lessons to offer to humanity had the best and the most richest of lessons to offer to the people of his time and for generations to come. After Waqa'at al-Harrah, when Yazid alayh came into Medina and he raped every woman and he drove his army into the masjid and they, they began to urinate on the member of Rasulullah. Imam Zain al Abidin began a revival and a revolution amongst humanity, and that was the intellectual revolution and the emotional revolution. For he gave amnesty to his own enemies, and he was able to bring them here tonight and the nights of Muharram and this Ashura. We are meant to learn from the lessons of Imam Hussein to put discrimination aside to come about in equality with our brothers and sisters, either in faith or humanity, and to approach and to bring people towards Islam with emotions and with respect, with honor, not by the harsh approach that we see today. Those who are away from Ahl al-Bayt have the harsh approach. This is an open invitation to all of individuals around the world. Take the rope of Ahl al-Bayt and those nights of Ashura and come and learn about Hussein and come and get schooled at the Madrasa of Abba Abdullah. Until next time, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.